excited about this. I'm very excited about this afternoon's program. Um, we have Susan Ronald, and many of you may have remembered when she was here with, uh, with her book on Condé Nast. Um, but what I wanted to mention is that this author series program is a result of the work of our hardworking friends of the Ferguson Library. Not only do they raise money for us on an annual year, but they go around and scout for really great authors like Susan and make sure that they're available to the Stanford um, community. Look forward in September, we do have a program that will be live and in person. It will be our first one that has of our author series program since the pandemic that will be live. But um, right now I'm gonna introduce you to Mary Thies who is on the board of the Friends of the Ferguson Library, this wonderful group who makes all of this possible. Thank you, Alice. It is my great joy and privilege to um, be able to introduce all of you to Susan Ronald, our speaker today. Susan was born in the United States, but lives in England where she has lived for a number of years. She is a biographer, a historian, and the author of several books. In addition to the Condé Nast book, which Alice mentioned, she wrote A Dangerous Woman and Hitler's Art Thief and Heretic Queen, among others. She is a meticulous researcher and uses an incredible number of resources um, for her book. And the book that she's going to be talking today about is The Ambassador, which is about Joseph Kennedy at the time when he was ambassador to Great Britain um, at the beginning of World War II. We will have a time for Q&A at the end of Ms. Ronald's presentation. So if you have questions as we go along, please enter them in the chat and we will bring them to her then. Thank you, Susan. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, I'm really happy to be here and uh, thank you everybody for coming to listen to me at, uh, at two o'clock in the afternoon. I'm gonna try and screen share, so bear with me. Here we go. There we are, okay. People ask, why Joe Kennedy? What made you want to write about him? You know, people know bits and pieces about him. Some know a lot about him, but the answer is actually quite simple. Um, I write about power and greed. So this is my shameless piece of self-promotion that I'm giving you. Uh, the last three books are about uh, powerful people and greed. Uh, the only one who is a good guy is actually Condé Nast, okay? We'll move on from that real quick. Joe Kennedy was seen to be the founder of the Kennedy political dynasty. He had nine children. Um, they were all heavily competitive with one another. Uh, they were often described as a clan or a tribe, and they actually were. Uh, Joe Jr., the oldest, uh, died unfortunately during the war, um, but he was uh, seemed to be the brother who they loved, but they also feared the most. He was apparently quite a bully actually, and resembled his father the most as well. The actual founder of the American Kennedy clan was Patrick Joseph Kennedy, who was Joe's father. He was a first generation American. He was very active in East Boston, which was the poor immigrant area, primarily of um, Irish immigrants. And he was the one that got the Kennedy side of the family involved in politics. He was the head of Ward Two, uh, and if you've ever read Edwin O'Connor's book, The Last Hurrah, that, that will give you an idea of uh, the type of uh, shenanigans that they got up to. Um, he became actually quite wealthy out of being a local ward politician, which was a I scratch your back, you scratch mine type of existence. Um, but the man who, who was really uh, in charge of Boston democratic politics was John Fitzgerald, who was known as Honey Fitz. He was Rose Kennedy's father. Uh, he looked down on Patrick Kennedy. He was twice mayor of Boston. He was a state senator, and he also went to the House of Representatives and uh, didn't like the fact that uh, Kennedy was courting his eldest uh, college-educated daughter, um, but only agreed to allow her to marry um, the, the Joe because he was going to become the youngest bank president in America. Here's a picture of Joe as the youngest bank president in America. That, never mind that the bank was a very small Boston bank and that his father owned most of the shares. 
This is the wedding picture. Um, I have previously, previously said, don't really like the gown. Somebody else said they didn't really like the tree that she was taking with her. But they were married in October, 1914. One of the things that Honey Fitz did as well was to make sure to keep that he would keep Joe on the straight and narrow, which of course he never could do, but he gave Joe his own private secretary, the man on the right here, whose name was Eddie Moore. And as a matter of fact, Ted Kennedy was is named Edward Moore Kennedy after him. He became a permanent fixture in the family, a surrogate parent, um, and stayed with Joe until he actually died. This picture was taken in 1938 when he was on holiday with his wife, Mary, next to him and Rose uh, and the children in Samaritz. Joe, by 1917, had two sons by Rose, uh, Joe Jr. on the left and Jack. I don't call John F. Kennedy uh, John. I call him Jack because that's how the family always referred to him. But in 1917, the war came to America, World War I came to America, but it was called the Great War, of course, because you can't begin to number them until there's a second one of them, can you? So he asked for a reserved occupation, meaning that he would not be drafted. He'd already received his draft notice, um, but Honey Fitz arranged for him to become a manager at the Four River Shipyard in Boston. The only problem is that um, Joe hadn't been properly briefed, combination of that, and also people had actually um, been drafted in management, and he was unaware of the fact that all the workmen had been promised a raise. The Assistant Secretary of the Navy, <coughs> Franklin Delano Roosevelt, um, was angry because everybody walked out. Joe closed down one of the most important shipyards on the Eastern Seaboard. And he and Charles Schwab, who was in charge, who owned the shipyard and he was in charge of Bethlehem Steel, had to step in personally to get the men back to work. And Joe was put into a lesser function until the war was over. After the war, he went to work for a small stockbroker in uh, Boston called Hayden Stone and liked the idea of making money. And so after a couple of years there, he went to Wall Street really in his own, uh, off his own bat. By 1925, he made his first millions, set up his children actually with million dollar trust funds in 1925. He bought this house in, uh, on Palmville Avenue in, uh, sorry, Palmfield Avenue in Bronxville in New York, and then set about making his second fortune because he heard that they were gonna make talkies in California and Los Angeles. And he thought, this is, this is a thing for me. I know what I'm gonna do. But instead of actually making his money out of his movies, he had uh, Louis Kirstein, who owned uh, Filene's uh, department store in Boston, back him to buy a very small company, film distribution company called the Booking Offices of America, Film Booking Offices of America. And Joe began his hype with, you know, he's a, he's a master showman of the world. He, his films were usually quite um, profitable, but they were what I would call C or D films, really. Um, where Joe made his money was in merging FBO with RKO, and then later on merging it with Pathé. So he created the very first very large studio. The other thing he did in Hollywood was to manage the biggest star, Gloria Swanson, and they also became lovers. Now, unfortunately, within two years, Joe's tires of his job. He always does that within two years. That's why he has such a bitty career. Um, but in the main, because he did, he made two films with uh, Gloria towards the end in 1930, one called Queen Kelly, um, which was so bad it was never released. Um, and the other one called What a Widow. And uh, when Gloria asked him, isn't there a bookkeeping area, uh, error here? You seem to have given the writer uh, a new Cadillac for coming up with the title, What a Widow. Joe looked at her, turned bright red and literally walked out of her life. She never ever heard from him again. And she talks about it actually on the Dick Cavett show in 1976. So it shows how long things stayed with her. He then goes back to New York, and I thought you'd like to see this image of Central Park in 1930 after the Wall Street crash. 
Um, what was common then were things called apple days when uh, those Wall Street tra traders who were still in work were given a lot of time off to sell apples on the streets in order to make ends meet. But Joe wasn't paying any attention to the poor or the plight of America. He had decided he wanted to make his third fortune now and also get involved in politics. So what better way than to uh, become friendly with Elliot Roosevelt, who was the oldest son of Franklin. And um, in, in the 1932 campaign, Elliot was in charge of trying to run his father's campaign in Massachusetts, in Boston, while also setting up an insurance business. So Joe befriends him and calls himself his foster father, okay? Um, what happens then is before prohibition is actually um, uh, rescinded, Joe takes Elliot to Europe. And even though there are lots of other people who are trying to bargain for the, um, the rights to import whiskey to America, when you're coming with the man who everybody thinks is, is the future president's son, uh, you're gonna win out. And there was just absolutely no contest. Joe won out. Uh, so before, uh, prohibition had been rescinded shortly after the election, uh, Joe had already bagged his next fortune. But what Joe really wanted, because he had his own people working for him, he didn't have to be involved in the day-to-day -day with his Somerset importing of, of liquor, he wanted to become Secretary of the Treasury. And he'd worked hard to help Roosevelt uh, earn his money, uh, earn money, sorry, from contributions from all kinds of people uh, during the 32 campaign. But of course, Roosevelt said, Joe Kennedy would run the treasury the way he wants to and wouldn't pay me a blind bit of, of notice. So Henry Morgenthau was his choice and stayed his choice. Joe had to settle to become the first chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission. He did a reasonable job. All of the documentation and all of the laws, however, were written by others. And Joe ended up trying to befriend them. The only one who actually worked with Joe long afterwards was a, a man called um, James Landis, who um, was one of the writers of, of uh, Kennedy's uh, unpublished memoir. He finally made the cover of Time Magazine, which of course means that for Joe, that's great success. But now we're 1935. He's been in the job from 1933 until 1935. It's time to retire. He tells Roosevelt, I need to retire for personal reasons. I have to go to Europe. And Roosevelt says, oh, do me a favor. Would you, as an unofficial advisor, could you find out from everyone in Europe when they're gonna repay our war debts? Because it would really help us go around the corner from depression into recovery. So he goes to um, Berlin, doesn't meet anybody important. Hitler refuses to meet him. He goes to Rome. Uh, he has contacts with the Vatican, but Mussolini refuses to meet with him. Goes to Paris. William C. Bullitt, who's the ambassador, American ambassador in Paris, really doesn't want Joe on his uh, patch. So, um, it's only in, in London when he meets with the American ambassador there, uh, Robert Bingham, who uh, called Robert Bingham, uh, introduces him to the right people, including Neville Chamberlain, who was at the time the Chancellor of the Exchequer. He also introduces him to bankers and loads of other people. And, and Joe kind of gets the idea during this 1935 visit, or October 1935, hmm, I think I'd quite like to be ambassador to Britain, and I think I could help my children get uh, some international experience. But anyway, it's 1935, there's gonna be a 36th election again to reelect Roosevelt, and so Joe goes to work, figures if I don't get the, if I don't become secretary of the treasury, maybe I can become ambassador. So he writes a pamphlet, uh, over the winter called I'm for Roosevelt, which is aimed at primarily at the businessmen because the one thing uh, that Roosevelt had trouble with was big business in America. They hated him. They thought that he had communistic uh, tendencies and there were all kinds of rumors that were being spread against Roosevelt. So uh, the other person that Kennedy gets involved in is uh, now Bishop Francis Spellman, he wasn't um, a cardinal as yet, but Spellman is, is pivotal because he spent his entire youth 
in the Vatican, and he was effectively the translator for the Pope, as well as for uh, Eugenio Pacelli, who's pictured below with his entourage to the right of the screen, um, and Joe Kennedy's just to the left. So Pacelli wants to come to America. Joe wants Pacelli to meet with the president because he wants to develop a closer relationship with Catholic Rome. Um, it's a dream of his. Uh, and um, essentially what happens is Spellman says, well, he, Pacelli isn't going to meet with him until such time as he is reelected. And there was a big hoo-ha between uh, Joe and uh all the others, but fortunately, uh, Roosevelt won and Pacelli went to see him the day after the election. And this picture is actually at Hyde Park. The gentleman on the left, though, becomes quite chummy with Joe. His name is Enrico Galeazzi, and he is um, basically the Vatican architect, but he's also the architect of fascism within the Vatican. Now, the thing that Joe didn't understand about the Vatican's position at that time is since 1929, when he did his deal with Mussolini, the Vatican had agreed to stay out of politics, period. They gave up the papal states in Italy, uh, they created the Vatican City, and all that we know today as the Vatican. He then also did a number of agreements throughout Europe with a lot of the fascist countries, including Germany, so that he could protect the, um, the Catholics within those countries, but also get more money for the Catholic Church. And Joe didn't understand this. 1926 election, I thought you should see that there was a time when America was all blue, almost. Joe fails to get appointed as ambassador, because of course Bingham is still in his position, even though he's not a well man, and is instead given the very lowly position of um, the first chairman of the Federal Maritime Commission. Why? Because there are 400 postal contracts that were uh, gouging uh, the government, they were fraudulent actually, and he had 73 days to sort them out. Now, he did do it in the 73 days, and he worked very hard to do it. But at the same time, he said, well, if I'm not going to appreciate it in politics, and if Roosevelt isn't going to look after me, I'm going to end up buying most of William Randolph Hearst's newspapers, which were up for sale for probably 50 cents on the dollar. Um, Joe wanted to buy them for 10 cents on the dollar. That story, unfortunately, made the cut in my book, but it is a very interesting story. Joe then decides, okay, it's going to be ambassador or nothing. And uh, at the end of 1937, he has this picture taken of the family. This is a portrait that is going to sell him as ambassador. Um, this is what he set his heart on. It's what he wants to give to Rose so that the family can be in the social register and the Kennedys will no longer be uh, just also Rand's. His, his greatest dream was to make the name as great as the name of Adams in Boston. His son, Joe Jr., was uh, going to be graduating from Harvard in June 1938. Joe was studying government, and he had made Spain his special area of interest. Now, why Spain? Because there was the, the Spanish Civil War at the time. But most importantly, it was because um, that was a war which the church had taken the side of the uh, rebels with Franco as opposed to the government side uh, or the loyalist side, which was socialist and communist. Um, and one thing I have to say is that Joe and, and Joe Jr. had a morbid fear of communism. Jack, in the meantime, has just started his first year at Harvard. He's only two years younger than Joe Jr., but he was a very, very sickly child. And it was only in 1947 that the family discovered he suffered from Addison's disease. Um, but at this time, nobody had any idea what was wrong with him, and he became, a, a, in his own words, a very interesting case. He goes to Europe that summer with his good friend, Lem Billings, and writes home and writes a diary. And that diary is actually available at the JFK Library online, and it really does make very, very interesting reading, um, because you have Joe Jr. who's writing to his father and, and expounding uh, everything that he says with my father says, my father believes, whereas Jack, who because of his illness has read so much, he was definitely the reader of the family, 
he's thinking things through. He's trying to understand what, what's happening between communism and fascism, particularly in Europe and how that's going to affect America. Um, he was definitely a, a very clear headed internationalist thinker. So how is Joe gonna achieve this? Well, he's been buddies with a lot of the press a lot of the time. Bingham writes to him that he's coming back to Johns Hopkins Hospital for exploratory surgery because nobody's been able to figure out what's wrong with him. He's very ill, he hears that he's going to retire. So Joe asks his good friend, Arthur C. Kroc, who was the Washington bureau chief uh, of the New York Times to help him get the word out that you know, he's the best man for this job uh, that Bingham is retiring from. Bingham wanted Tom Watson of IBM for the job instead. Um, I have to say at this point uh, that uh, Mr. Kroc claimed in his memoir that he never received any financial benefit from Joe Kennedy, but actually um, that's only if you don't count the $25,000 a year that he got, plus all of the vacations in Europe and at Palm Beach, okay? I also need to say that I don't think the New York Times was aware of that relationship. So these are the guys, these are the three men that are going to make the name of Kennedy great. Um, Joe Jr. Is, has says to his father, he's already been to Russia once, he's been around Europe. Jack has now been around Europe. And Arthur Kroc is also a very dear friend of the boys and trying to help them promote them into politics. Joe finally gets nominated because of Arthur Crocks leaking the fact that he should be he should be uh, become the ambassador, and he finally sorry I, I missed a slide I apologize he is finally sworn in in February 1938. The news leak took place in de uh, December 9th 1937. Now why there was this delay um, I, I ask about in the book but um, it's still something of a mystery. And uh, there are a number of different reasons why it could have happened, but you have to read the book to understand that. Um, anyway, he, he comes to London on March the 1st, and it, this is a picture of Joe on March 8th, 1938, in front of the Palace of St. James's, as he's going in to give his credentials to King George VI. The gentleman on the second from the left in the uniform is an American, um, he's Colonel, Raymond Lee, who um, didn't get along with Joe, he was his military attache. And in his book, he had said already by this time, Joe's only been in town a week, says that he was drunk on his own verbosity. And that is probably the most true statement anybody has ever said about Joe. Joe was constantly shooting his mouth off without realizing that messages got back to people. By the time he'd been appointed as ambassador, Roosevelt knew all the terrible things that he had said about him, but he sent him out into, into uh, England because he was less of a danger to him overseas than he was to him in Washington, because Joe was an isolationist. Joe did not believe that America should had any international obligations other than to earn money. The first person that he put, uh, whose nose he put out of joint was a week later, uh, Randolph Churchill. Um, and Randolph and Winston Churchill took Joe out for lunch and Joe was spewing about how um, Britain didn't know what it was doing and it shouldn't be hurt hurtling itself towards war. And Randolph at the time was a journalist and um, Winston apparently stood up and turned purple at the luncheon and lectured Joe for 10 minutes and walked out. Randolph, on the other hand, talked about um, Joe's uh, credentials at um, the palace of, um, sorry, at St. James's Palace um, by saying that he only stood out because he and the waiters were the only people in long trousers. There was a big thing in the American press about him wearing short breeches and how he couldn't do that because Joe Kennedy was so bow-legged, everybody would think it would make him a laughing stock. So now Joe is the ambassador. He's given his credentials to the king. The king, uh, of course, is affable. Um, he has a duty to court Joe as well as Joe going around to meet all of the other ambassadors. And he reports back uh, on the 9th and 10th of March what all of the other ambassadors are saying uh, about the European situation. 
to these two gentlemen. The first uh, on top is Cordell Hull, who is the Secretary of State. He's actually the longest serving Secretary of State in American history. And beneath is the Assistant Secretary Sumner Wells. Now, within days of this, um, literally on the 15th of March, Joe does the unpardonable, th unpardonable thing. And in a telephone call with Hull, says, I am the European expert. You just shut up. You don't know what's going on here. And therefore, within 15 days of his arrival in England, he had the State Department angry. Now, why did he think that? Well, his good friend, Enrico Galeazzi, who was a committed fascist, okay, was the one advising him, was one of the ones advising him. Joe Jr. was also advising him, but Joe Jr. was also listening to this. Uh, as a matter of fact, Kennedy hired his son on a $1 a year salary against the wishes of the president and the um, State Department. And the reason why they didn't want him to hire him was because he was utterly inexperienced. However, Joe met again, met Neville Chamberlain again, who by now is prime minister. And he thought that Neville Chamberlain had the answer to everything. Appeasement was a wonder. And Joe started to sing his praises back to the State Department and to the White House, getting them even angrier. He said nasty things about Anthony Eden, who the president personally liked and enjoyed talking to. He thought that um, Edward Wood, who's Lord Halifax below, who is uh, the replacement, uh, effectively Secretary of State or Foreign Minister, um, thought that he was a bit too um, Protestant for his liking, which is true. He was extremely religious and high Anglican, as we say here. Um, but he's, he's got on well enough with Halifax. Halifax, the first time he met him, was not surprised that Joe was swearing like a trooper and acting terribly. Um, and he wrote that to the British ambassador. So that I'm um, backing you up now to March 11th. He meets Joachim von Ribbentrop in London, who was the ambassador uh, and is now foreign minister to Germany. Uh, Von Ribbentrop is in London to present the new German ambassador to Britain, um, Herbert von Dirksen. And I laugh because I just think, you know, you take one look at this guy and you go, oh my goodness, what's, what's going to happen next? Um, von Dirksen had been in Poland in the 1920s. He was called the Terror of Poland. He was then moved in the early 1930s to Tokyo and was responsible for bringing Japan closer to the Axis powers. Uh, so now he's in, in England and he's under strict orders from Ribbentrop to befriend Kennedy. And already by June, they have two separate meetings in which Kennedy um, is loose lips, he's drunk on his own verbosity, and he's actually betraying um, American for, foreign policy. The day after this meeting is the Angelus. Kennedy writes in his diary, I'm very disappointed Lord Halifax can't come with me to Oxford. It seems he's tied up on some more important international business. That's his only remark about the Angelus, the annexation of Austria into Germany. He thinks, Joe thinks that Chamberlain has um, uh, Hitler under control, but he also thinks that all he has to do is meet with Hitler and he'll be able to solve all the problems because he's a great businessman, he thinks that he can handle diplomacy and politics. And as I say in the book, the sad thing is he didn't have a diplomatic bone in his body. Winston Churchill is against him, but most of the British establishment is still following um, uh, our dear friend, Mr. Chamberlain. In April, 1938, he and Rose are invited to Windsor Castle and now Joe is getting drunk on British high society and all the wonderful things that they're seeing and doing. And he sees how happy this is making Rose. He knows they're gonna be in the social register back home. He has made it impossible for American debutantes to come to England to be presented at court unless they have a clear, um, est clearly established relationship with Britain. Rose and he become friendly with the Duke of Kent, the youngest royal brother. And Rose presents her two eldest daughters, uh, Rosemary on the right and Kick or Kathleen on the left, 
in May 1938 uh, at court. And it's interesting when you, I quote from Rose's diary when she when she talks about this, she doesn't talk about how the girls did, only about how she did. Sorry, I've skipped a slide. Excuse me. Um, one of the things that Joe did in, in April is he had asked uh, Nancy Astor, pictured below with her husband Waldorf, to see if he could um, actually introduce his daughter Kick to some nice English people her own age. And Kick attended a party, Easter weekend party at Cliveden, um, which is now a hotel in Berkshire. There she met Jean Ogilvy, who became her best friend in England. And then also uh, about two weeks later, Jean's cousin, Billy Hartington. Now, Billy was the heir to the Duke of Devonshire and literally it was love at first sight and it was a tremendous love affair. Meanwhile, Halifax, the Anschluss has taken place. Halifax is very worried that appeasement isn't working. So he and Churchill that same spring start to work together on other economic means of trying to outwit Germany. Um, Kennedy is completely oblivious about that. What counts is that he's got his family in Europe. He's giving his boys international experience. And he also is putting himself in pole position for maybe going for the vice presidency in 1940, maybe even the presidency. And this lady who should be very well known to all of you is Claire Booth Luce. In May, 1938, she and Henry came to the embassy in London. And shortly afterwards, she um, began an affair with, jo with uh, Joe. Interestingly, you know, as a, as a staunch Republican, she became one of his greatest advisors. So she tells Joe, you can't keep staying in London. That's not gonna get you votes back home. What you gotta do is get yourself some press and go back home to some great press, ASAP. Go back home every three months so people don't forget what you look like. And he took her at her word. The only problem is he, the next time he was gonna go home was in June for Joe Jr.'s uh, graduation from Harvard. Um, and of course, Arthur Kropp was very happy to give him good press which made Roosevelt angry. I mean, really angry. He refused to see him. So he's, he's so angry that Joe starts to go early to the graduation, but then discovers that Harvard University is going to refuse to give him an honorary doctorate. Instead, they chose 14 other people, including Walt Disney. And it was Walt Disney that got Joe upset. He comes back to Europe. One of the reasons why he had been chosen in, in terms of Roosevelt was that he was a good businessman and there was a major trade agreement that was being negotiated with America at the time. And they thought that Joe was a good businessman, could negotiate this. But by the end of June, beginning of July, Joe's spending time trying to arrange for the family to go to Antibes instead. He's lying back to the uh, State Department that everybody's disappearing at the end of July, when the State Department already knew that he had already, he had planned to go at the end of July. Um, and everybody else in Britain was staying on because there was something very wrong in Europe and they thought that the Hitler was going to move again. Instead, the reason why he wanted to go to Antibes is to prevent Billy Hartington asking Kick to marry him. It was going to be his 21st birthday, and Joe feared that he would ask her and she would accept. The last thing he wanted was for his good Catholic daughter to marry a Protestant, particularly as Peter Grace of W.R. Grace was madly in love with her as well. But Kick only loved Billy. The picture below is Jack with his sister at um, Antibes. Here's a picture of the whole family in front of their little cabana at the beach. And Joe, again, I have him here with his mouth open because while he was there, he was shooting his mouth off about how Morgenthau was useless, how uh, Sumner Wells was useless, how Cordell Hull was useless, how the whole State Department, if it were in his hands, he could fix well, they didn't think it was broken, of course. Um, his next door neighbors, uh, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor heard about it. And actually um, uh, Edward was uh, so perturbed about it that he let the royal family know back in England that there's a problem with Joe. Joe meanwhile meets another neighbor, Marlena Dietrich, and they begin an affair. 
Um, this is Marlena with her daughter, Maria Riva. And if you ever want to read some, something that's absolutely riveting, it's Maria's um, biography of her mother. And her remarks about the Kennedy children are absolutely delicious. So Joe's having his affair with Marlena Dietrich. Um, he's still there when the Czech crisis starts um, and comes back very belatedly via Paris and horns in on a meeting of the other American um, ambassadors to Britain and um, discovers, oh, this is actually something quite important. I better get back to, to London and tell Chamberlain what to do. He portrays Chamberlain to the State Department and to Roosevelt as the only man who can save the world from disaster. He's the only man that can bring peace um, and this is, and I'm just going through something that Joe repeats ad nauseum and gets the State Department and the president angrier and angrier because of course, Chamberlain had refused Roosevelt's um, overtures for peace in January, 1938. And so they knew that they were dealing with a very difficult man who was actually probably anti-American. Chamberlain comes back after Munich at the end of September, waving his piece of paper, claiming peace for our time. And Halifax's heart is broken. He has shivers when he hears what he said, what Chamberlain says, because he knows that appeasement is dead and that Britain absolutely must rearm. But of course it doesn't. This is a local newspaper, uh, which actually says it all, um, that Hitler is just running roughshod over everybody. Two months after um, uh, Munich, we have Kristallnacht. Um, which was an excuse and nothing else for um, looting and pillaging and killing Jews. Joe decides, well, maybe this, this Jewish thing might be of interest to me. If I want to run for office in America, I might be able to get the Jewish vote. And he thinks about putting together something that he calls the Kennedy Plan. This is just one of the 900 synagogues that was uh, destroyed on Kristallnacht. Joe goes back to America for a prolonged holiday, um, Christmas holiday, between 38 and 39. He's gone for two months. This has been a thing of his. He constantly goes back for two months at Christmas. And meanwhile, the exodus of Jews from uh, German occupied territories and actually Eastern Europe begins. So Joe writes, and that's in, in, uh, in inverted commas here, that Joe writes something called the Kennedy Plan which is effectively stolen from other work written by other people who are actually working out of the London embassy. He comes back in the middle of February and immediately asks if he could be the envoy to Rome because Pope Pius XI has died and his good friend Eugenio Pacelli and uh, Enrico, well, has is now become Pope Pius XII. Enrico Galeazzi says, sure, you and Rose can come except he comes with all of his children, the nannies, um, his butler, and a few other people. Um, and there's, uh, I write about uh, exactly what happens, but Joe doesn't understand, you know, two seats at a papal coronation is quite amazing, but then to take all these other seats is, is terrible. And I have a quote by Pope John Paul, um, but I'm gonna plug my book again and say, you have to read it to, to get to that. While he's in Rome, again, he's in the wrong place at the wrong time, Hitler decides to take the rest of Czechoslovakia and he marches in. Meanwhile, Rose goes back to London and is again presented at court with Eunice this time uh, so that she can come out in grand style. And that year, the, the biggest party happened to have been at Blenheim Palace, which is pictured below and is a World Heritage Site. The following month, the King and Queen meet with the, uh, with the Roosevelts at um, Hyde Park. Joe tries to claim loudly that he's the one that had organized this, but it had actually been in the offing since um, 1936 when uh, George VI became king. Uh, Roosevelt had sent a special envoy to the coronation to ask him to please come to America. And it's at this point that Roosevelt warns the king that if he wants to know about American foreign policy, he shouldn't be asking Joe Kennedy. 
Joe is now desperate. He believes that there's going to be a war, but that he's got to talk people out of going, you know, letting Hitler, just let Hitler have his head. He'll be fine. And so effectively what happens is he asks uh, Charles Lindbergh to please write a big report about how futile it's going to be to go to war against Germany. And this report is circulated throughout American embassies and the State Department. And of course, um, it gives the president a heads up as to what um, Lindbergh is going to be doing if, he, if war comes and he comes back to America. And certainly um, he became the spokesman for the America First Committee, uh, whose motto was uh, make America great again. And um, as you can see, he and Roosevelt were not on good terms. August, 1939, the thing that, Bruce, that uh, Churchill had feared the most happens. The Molotov-Ribbentrop uh, Act, uh, sorry, Pact happens, and that is going to guarantee a war because of course, Germany is not going to have to go and fight the Soviets to begin with. And within days, actually it's, I think seven days, um, Britain is forced to declare war on Germany when Germany invades Poland. Joe is now completely sidetracked side by the um, Foreign Office uh, and also by um, the American State Department. They're working together either through the British ambassador in America or through other people. Uh, Roosevelt is now in touch directly with Churchill and everything that he's hearing from Kennedy is very different from everything he's hearing from Churchill. So in, uh, Joe decides in late November 1939, I'm going away. I'm going to not come back. I've got stomach ulcers or whatever. And nobody ever knows what's really wrong with his gastrointestinal system. Um, but, and he actually, this is the only medical document ever of any of the Kennedys on file at the Kennedy Library. He actually has his doctor write to Roosevelt saying that his gastrointestinal tract needs him to stay in Palm Beach. Well, Chamberlain asked for him to come back in March, and it's only when he learns that in March 1940 that Sumner Wells is going to be going around Europe that Joe leaves Palm Beach and comes back um, uh, into, into Britain. And here is a picture of Joe chaperoning uh, Sumner Wells with a Chamberlain and with Halifax. Um, as a matter of fact, the King's Diary states how upset he was that Joe wouldn't let him meet privately with uh, Sumner Wells. There was, as you know, a long period called the Phony War where between September 1939 and April 1940, when nothing at all was happening, uh, Germany invaded Norway in April 1940. Uh, the British were soundly defeated. Um, and this is really the end of the Phony War. Within uh, three weeks, Churchill is um, asked to form a government by the king because even though Chamberlain had won the vote in parliament, it was by such a slim margin. Um, everybody knew that Britain was, was possibly going to perish because it hadn't rearmed adequately enough. And Churchill had been talking about this since 1933. He was the only man that could possibly save the country. I should say, sorry, I should say that Joe is also the only man who did not congratulate him on becoming prime minister. There were four different documents I came across. And finally, it was noted that Joe made a telephone call to congratulate Churchill. Um, within six months of Churchill becoming uh, prime minister, Wood was moved to become the British ambassador to America on the retirement of, the, of um, Ronald Lindsay, who was the previous ambassador. Not so much because they didn't get on, but mostly because he felt that Wood would be an honest broker for him in America. Um, and uh, he was, uh, and actually, his sons um, had befriended Kick in England. And when one of them came to America, it was Kick who helped him through his problems. Uh, he'd lost both legs in the African campaign and she was absolutely wonderful to him and would help Kick get back to Europe so that she could marry Billy Hartington in 1943. In the summer of 1940, obviously the blitz begins. Um, people were taking shelter where they could. 
Joe Kennedy was told, you cannot come back to America, you have to stay in England and you have to help as much as you can. Well, he bought an ambulance, but he never went to see the bombed out areas. This is as close as Joe Kennedy came to a bomb. He told everybody that he was, that he was actually um, uh, bombed out of the American ambassador's residence in the West End, but uh, there are bombs, there, there, on the internet, you can see where the bombs actually fell and there were absolutely no bombs. So um, he became known as Jittery Joe at this time. He had left London. He didn't go to see any of the bombed out areas. He didn't inquire after the King and Queen when uh, Buckingham Palace had been bombed. Uh, he was a, a very, very, very scared man. But the one man who wasn't scared was Jack. Okay, this is a picture of Joe with Winston Churchill as he is leaving England in October 1940. He recently had a tea with the King of England and the Queen, and he upset them so much that the King wrote him a letter about how wrong he is about Britain and how wrong he is about the need to fight. And I do put that in the book. His good friend, Neville Chamberlain, who had remained a part of the, of the cabinet, dies about two weeks after Joe leaves. And he, as he's leaving, he reads these, these, these constant things from, from Churchill, these wonderful, um, uh, inspiring words and hates him ever more. He comes back to the States in November um, on Claire Booth Luce's, under Claire Booth Luce's guidance, he is going to declare for Wilkie. Um, he blackmails actually uh, Roosevelt into coming back to America. And that's something I don't want to go into in the chat, but it's a fascinating portrait of what happens to a person who doesn't realize that they should keep their own counsel. Um, he lobbies for no war. He lobbies against um, Britain. He talks against Britain and uh, he is thoroughly hated by the British as much as he is by the State Department. But in America, nobody knows really what's been going on. And when Japan bombs Pearl Harbor, he decides, oh, I guess I better go to war. And he um, you know, sends Roosevelt a, a cable saying, I'm yours to command, just name the place. And of course, he never hears back from him. The ambassadorship to Great Britain at a time when there was still a British empire and that made Great Britain very important um, was the highest office he would ever achieve. And until his dying day, he, he wanted to be called Mr. Ambassador. His sons, however, were braver. Uh, Jack, as we all know, had um, the PT-109 experience, but uh, there is another experience, which is his first diplomatic experience I write about in the book, the very first casualties, uh, civilian casualties of the war, and American and Canadian civil, ca uh, civil casualties of the war took place on September 4th, 1938. And it was Jack, not his father, who handled it with the survivors, and he was brilliant. Um, Joe Jr. Uh, was a naval pilot. He was apparently a very mediocre pilot and had there not been a war, he probably wouldn't have been um, the main pilot of an aircraft, but he had volunteered to be the, um, the first drone pilot because he didn't want Jack to be a greater hero than he. And Jack had obviously already been decorated for the PT-109 incident and saving his crew's life, lives. Um, and that's why he volunteered because of the, the competition between them. So he, there was a failure of an ambassador, but this man's greatest legacy was his children who absolutely adored him. And he did everything for them. And according to Jack, when he was president, he, Joe Kennedy made everything possible. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. That was fascinating. It was wonderful. I'm trying to get out of screen share. <laughs> <laughs> uh, pause share. Should I do that? Yeah, would that help? No, I don't know. Let's see if I can get myself back on instead. Um, no. 
I'm trying to get back on because I don't want people to ask questions to the slides. <laughs> Help. <laughs> no, I don't want to resume share. I don't want a new share. Should I do that? No, it's not helping. Help. Quit PowerPoint. Let's see. Yes. There we go. Hi. You did it. Excellent. Well done. Well Thank done. You. So uh, we do have some questions in the chat if you're willing to sure. tackle these. Um, one uh, question is, how does Joe maintain his reputation today in the United States? And, and why is this information about his tie as the ambassador not more well known? I, that's the main question I asked myself when I was reading all of the Kennedy biographies. Why is it, hasn't anybody written about his time in, in England? What, I, I just couldn't get it. The closest uh, anybody came to writing about it is Will Swift in his The Kennedys um, and the Gathering Storm, which is a very nice book about the Kennedy family in Britain at the time, <clears throat> but not about the political and diplomatic dilemma that was going on. <clears throat> and so I like writing about people who are reasonably well known if I can, but little known stories about them. So I, I decided I was gonna take the slice of two years and concentrate on that. No one else had written about it. And I think that's the main reason why nobody knows because with all of the Kennedy biographies around, <clears throat> nobody was interested enough to write about it. Um, I think also perhaps even Will Swift did not come to England to do research. Um, he had a researcher here, but he personally didn't come to do it. And when um, Nassau wrote his book, uh, his big biography on Kennedy, he was using Will Searches, Will, sorry, Will Swift's research uh, and thanks him for it. <clears throat> so that means they didn't go to the Churchill archive personally. They didn't see Winston Churchill scribbling in his own hand, Kennedy finally called today. Okay, they didn't, they didn't see the note. The researcher missed the note. Thank goodness we won't have to hear uh, Kennedy's vapors any longer when we're in the House of Commons. Okay, these are all things that, you know, I believe in doing the research myself. So yeah, I found these, yes, but nobody, nobody has been to, had been to the Royal Archive before me. And it's a bit of a, a big thing to get into the Royal Archive. Um, you know, anybody who's, who is accredited and with the publisher can do it, but it takes a long time for it to happen. So I think that nobody else has written about what King George thought about him. And that's why the book is important. Mm -hmm. Of course. Wow. Thank you. Um, another question is um, about Joe's relationship to Jack and how did he help him even though their policies and approaches were so different? Um, I think well, it's easier to answer the second one than the first one. Um, okay, fine. <laughs> I'll answer the first one as well, but the second one first. When uh, Joe Jr. died, um, Jack was still in the hospital after PT 109 and he heard his brother was dead. And um, he apparently sighed and said, oh dear Lord, now it's down to me. Jack actually wanted to be a writer. Um, he started out as a journalist. Um, so he knew he had no choice. He had to take his brother's place. Um, I don't know that he would have had a choice even if Joe Jr. hadn't died um, because I think that it, Joe Sr. was, was hell-bent on creating a, a dynasty in his mind better than the Adams family had done. Mm -hmm. So that's, that was the main impetus for Jack going into politics. Um, how Joe helped is, is uh, their relationship. He was always his father's son. I mean, all the sons were womanizers like their father. They thought that was normal because that's the way they grew up. They also thought it was normal for the mother to be absent from the home for 300 days a year. Okay. And that was Rose's way of coping with Joe being a serial womanizer, okay? Um, a very difficult situation and really odd family makeup. But um, because there were so many children, they got strength through each, each other. 
they did clam together, they did club together, and Joe and Rose made sure that that was part of their upbringing. So they gave he gave them a sense of togetherness. They were he was always called dad by the boys and daddy by the girls. Rose uh, Rose was always called mother by all of them. She was a distant figure. Um, Jack never analyzed why she was a distant figure. Um, he claimed that's because she had too many children. Um, I think that that was a convenient way of his looking at it. Um, he adored his father and, and Joe adored his son. But, but what was Jack's strength was in never ever contradicting his father directly. He never said, you're wrong, dad, or, you know, I think you've got to do this. He found a very diplomatic way of speaking to him. And Joe ended up respecting him for his different views. But the main thing that Joe did is he financed the 1960 campaign. Mm -hmm. um, that, that was the thing. And there's going to be a book coming out by Erwin Gelman, um, I think in January, um, about the 1960 campaign. But and Joe, Joe helped by staying in the background because it was already known that he was a fascist sympathizer, certainly in political circles. And it was already known that he was an anti-Semite. Um, and that was certainly not gonna help Jack win any election. I should say that um, Roosevelt also called him a fascist sympathizer. Wow. Okay. So one of his gifts to his son was to keep his mouth shut. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> was um was there did his um did he have irish sympathies that compromised his support for the english well i think i, I believe he did but he hid them very well okay um one of the ambassadors who he cozied up to very early on was the irish ambassador um and he managed to wangle a an honorary doctorate at trinity college um in, in dublin uh, so you know he he was very pro ireland pro his irish roots but he didn't speak out um as an ambassador as being pro ireland mm -hmm. and it was a really difficult time um for the british in terms of accepting Ir the irish free state and also having Northern Ireland is still part of, of uh, the United Kingdom. So uh, I think he understood to a certain extent the sensibilities. Most of the British, because um, uh, there are loads and loads of things in the Foreign Office files at the National Archives, but when they were analyzing Joe, they didn't feel that he was anti-British so much as pro-Irish. Mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, which is interesting considering all the terrible things that said about uh, Britain's being stupid and uh, fighting Hitler. So. Well, is there anything to the stories that he was a bootlegger? Um, <laughs> probably. Um, certainly in, he had imported booze to America before prohibition was over and he had embroiled the president's son in that. Whoops. Um, but um, I have heard from friends in Boston that um, it is definitely what happened, but uh, in what I read, I didn't, you know, they said that he, had, he was connected to Al Capone. Prove it, nobody's proven it. And then again, the US government couldn't prove that Capone was doing what he was doing. So they had to get him on tax fraud. Um, so these are a couple of very smart cookies here. Um, I can't believe that Joe wasn't involved, but I have no proof that he was. Um, a lot of hearsay. Sure. So tell us about what you're currently reading and um, books that you might recommend for our participants okay. today. Um, I just finished Where the Crawdads Sing a few days, a few days ago and blew me away. I just, her use of language and uh, it's just, it's such a phenomenal book. Um, before that, um, I read a couple of books a week, three or four books a week. I Believe it or not, I was reading Peter Ustinov's um, autobiography. Um, and, the, and the reason for that is Peter's father appears in my next book, okay? And so um, it, it was just absolutely amazing. It was a very, very funny book. It's called Dear Me. 
Um, and I thought that was <laughs> wonderful. Uh, I don't know if anybody is a big PBS watcher there, but um, the book before that was called The Silk House by Anthony Horowitz. And Horowitz is um, the creator of Foil's War, which I think is on PBS mm -hmm. in America. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and he's also done other things like Midsummer Murders and whatever. He's a very big British, um, British name. And so I'm currently reading his, um, what's it called? Magpie Murders. I was going to call it Murder with Magpies. Magpie Murders. And then I'm also reading um, at the same time, of course, because you must read two books for pleasure, mustn't you? Um, the Dictator's Muse by Nigel Ferndale. And it's about Lenny Riefenstahl. And um, it's, it just it makes me laugh because the, the bits that are real are great fun, but the, the bits that are invented, like Lenny um, was close friends with Oswald Mosley, um, are, are not true. And I, those things make me laugh, but it is very well written. So good. Thank you. We are so grateful to you, Susan, for all that you have done today. This is fascinating. And I know that people were looking forward to reading your book. Um, we want to also thank the Friends of Ferguson and the Elm Street Books where they can purchase your book. Um, and to everyone who attended today, um, this is going to be re is recorded and will be available on the library's YouTube channel. Um, so if you had to leave early or had a friend who would like to pick it up, they can do that. Um, and it'll be ready tomorrow. Our next um, author series will take place on September 30th at 6.30. This will be an in-person series um, with Zakiah Harris, the author of The Other Black Girl, and it will take place at the Ferguson Library in conjunction with Darien Library. So our great thanks to all of you and have a wonderful day. Thanks again, Susan. Thank you very much. Take care now. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye.